The Majority Report with With Sam Cedar. It is Monday, October 9th, 2017. My name is Michael Brooks on a Michael Monday, and this is the five, five time award winning Majority Report. We're broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On today's program, the Manhattan DA. Cy Vance Jr., how many cases of powerful people facilitating campaign contributions to his campaigns and getting away with things are we going to uncover? First, it was two of the Trump kitties, Ivanka and Donald Jr., now movie producer, monster, commonly known monster, Harvey Weinstein, New reporting in the International Business Times. We're going to be talking with investigative reporter Jay Cassano about both of those cases, as well as, of course, the Weinstein stories that he, along with others, the International Business Times broke. The Trump administration is planning on scrapping an Obama administration climate and pollution rule with no replacement in sight. No surprise there. And also no surprise... Senator Bob Corker, in a Twitter dispute with Donald Trump, says what all of us are thinking. This idiot could get us into World War III. And Stephen Miller, with the look of an aspiring school shooter and the charm of a Nazi camp guard and the ideology of a Gamergate Grand Theft Auto player racist, is still a key policymaker in the White House. New reporting on him and just how, just relentlessly, he is a horrible, disgusting human being. He's so much that guy from high school. It's excessive how much he is that guy from high school. Uh, We're going to be talking about that. The president keeps trashing the Iran deal one of the greatest steps to global stability in the modern period, and his own mad dog doesn't agree with him. We'll get to that and much more, including Turkey all of a sudden saying, yeah, you're not going to get a visa to vacation here anymore. All that and much more on today's uh, majority report. Uh, Trump wasn't nice enough to the the security personnel? Apparently. and I'm sure there's all sorts of other sort of paranoia and things that relate to what the Erdogan uh, regime is doing. And I think we can switch to that regime language. Now, Donald Trump was, of course, uh, in Puerto Rico last week. We played it, everything from his sort of mind-blowingly offensive and stupid statements to the people of Puerto Rico. By Uh, the way, do you know how long he was in Puerto Rico where that highlight reel came from? I'm going to guess no more than two hours. Four. Okay. All right. (laughs) Always give the least charitable interpretation. Um, Okay, four. So he was there, and then, of course, we played the, and everybody ran with the toilet, the uh, paper towel uh, basketball shooting reel um, because it was just demented and bizarre and weird and off-key and kind of hilarious, which would be, I guess, a good uh, expression of this whole administration. Uh, As Adam Johnson said, the only thing they're competent at is racism. And here is Donald Trump talking with Twitter's uh, most active and most unfunny user, Mike Huckabee, on his new TV show uh, about his interpretation of throwing paper towels at people recovering from a major catastrophe, which he's just been belittling for most of his time since it happened over Twitter and on the ground, and then throwing paper towels at them like he's in a shooting contest. Here he is explaining what the fake news missed about it. So we did a great job, and we weren't treated fairly by the media because we really did a good job. I mean, one example, they had these beautiful soft towels, very good towels. And I came in, and there was a crowd of a lot of people, and they were screaming, and they were loving everything. And we were, I was having fun. They were having fun. They said, throw them to me, throw them to me, Mr. President. And so I'm doing some of the, 
So the next day they said, <laughs> oh, it was so disrespectful to the people. It was just a made up thing. And also when they had, when I walked in, the cheering was incredible. You were a they, rock star. I saw oh, the video of it. It was crazy. Uh, it it was was so crazy. The cheering was, it was deafening. They turned down the sound so that you just heard the announcers, Donald Trump. And I mean, look, <laughs> the media's fake. In the meantime, I'm here. It's, it's sort of amazing. So I'm here, and I sometimes ask myself, how did I ever get here with the horrible, unfair publicity? And I don't mind. Look, if it's fair, if I do something wrong, treat me badly. But when we're doing good, it should be fair. The media is, is really the word, I, I think one of the greatest of all terms I've, I've come up with is fake. I guess other people have used it perhaps over the years, but I've never noticed it. Uh, and it's a shame. And they really hurt the country because they take away the spirit of the country. Uh, we're doing so well in so many ways. Uh, I would say yes, perhaps other people have used the word fake over the years. Um, yeah, the media was totally unfair to him. They ran uninterrupted campaign rallies throughout the entirety of the fucking primary season, gave him an unending amount of free coverage to spew racism, entertainingly dunk on his opponents, and just sort of do freewheeling conspiracy theories and love his crowds. But now he's stressed out of his mind. He hates his job. And, of course, the press is being incredibly unfair. There is an olive branch he offers there, which is when he's doing badly, treat him badly. <laughs> to which I say, okay, I'll continue to treat you badly. You racist, disgusting, trust fund baby, daddy's boy, increasingly unstable buffoon. Um, we will be right back with Jake Cassano on the Majority Report. Pressures of a life and it tough. No stay down, mama time, pick it up. No bother with the down, full style, strictly up, full vibes. I pick it up when the bills, them, the rent and the mortgage due. Yeah, yeah. When me chalice, when your best friends are gone and it's only you. Yeah, like a pass, flip turn up the music. Skanking sweet. Everybody wanna feel. Brings everything together, so make we sing together. And who said life no order? And every man got this struggle. I beg you to help me, Lord, and let me overcome my struggles. Can't it sweet? Yeah. Everybody wanna feel like free. Forget your troubles and the rapid. Welcome back to the Majority Report, Michael Brooks. In the chair joining us now is Jay Cassano. He's a investigative reporter for the International Business Times. Jay, how are you doing? Good. Good to be back. It's a pleasure to have you back. And um, you guys have been doing some very interesting reporting on a, a Manhattan DA that is starting to resemble something out of like a Batman movie or something. Um, before we get, you have, you have two new pieces that you guys reported, you along with uh, David Sirota and uh, Josh Keefe. But before we get to that, you know, this attention that has been paid to Cy Vance, a junior in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, goes back to a story which kind of shockingly, I think, has not gotten that much attention. I mean, there's a lot of maybe, and I think part of it might be because everybody's sort of exhausted from Trump corruption stories. There's 
no surprise that his family would be corrupt. Um, but the story of, of essentially how it, how it seems as if, you know, sort of almost just kind of textbook, simple paint by the numbers corruption with Don Jr. and Ivanka and Cy Vance is sort of shocking. Maybe not shocking for Trump's, but it's shocking for Vance until uh, your additional reporting came out. But before we get to that, can you kind of run through the Don Jr. and Ivanka corruption story versed and the Manhattan district attorney? Yeah, um, it was a real bombshell report that, uh, that Jesse Eisinger and uh, the joint team at ProPublica and WNYC came out with last week. You know, they basically found that there was an aborted criminal investigation into Don Jr. and Ivanka Trump's real estate business, and they were uh, lying about how well units were selling in their uh, Trump Soho development. So, you know, kind of standard Trump family business practice, lie about how well your business is doing in order to get more business, always maintain right. that image, right? Right, right, right. Um, and, you know, while that investigation was ongoing, uh, Donald Trump Sr. Uh, was apparently getting kind of agitated that that investigation wasn't closed. So he sent his personal lawyer, Mark Kasowitz, uh, on the case. And Kasowitz had uh, given $25,000 to Vance's campaign earlier in the year. Kasowitz met with DA Vance, and the case was dropped. Um, now, it's true that the DA's office returned the $25,000 contribution that Kasowitz made once he was involved in the case, uh, citing you know their standard sort of conflict of interest policy on campaign contributions. But after the investigation was closed, Kasowitz came back with an even bigger donation for Vance and fundraised a little extra on top, bringing the total amount of cash he delivered to Vance to fifty thousand mm. dollars. Mm. So okay, and, yeah. So then, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, they basically they they skirted their own process, uh, and he he you know he raised even more money. And and the really striking thing about their story was that uh, when Kasowitz had that meeting with Vance, no one from the district attorney's offices investigative team that was actually working on the Don Jr. and Ivanka case was in the room. Right. It was just a meeting between Kasowitz, Vance, and a couple of his higher-ups. And then, you know, and recently, and, and now Vance has given it back several years later. Yes. Now, once it was brought to attend to the public's eye, you know, he said, oh, I'll give it back, you know, to sort of maintain uh, that image. But uh, Which, of course, looks even was... worse. I mean, I, you know... <laughs> Right. It's like, oh, well, now that this is this sort of unbelievable case on the public record, let me give it back. Now, before we get to the new things that you guys uh, have broke, I mean, can you tell us a little bit more, like some of, kind of some of the basics of Cy Vance? Uh, you know, he's not been particularly high profile. He's a Democrat. His dad was... Um, I believe Secretary of State in the Carter administration. He's you know kind of a familiar sort of blue blood inherited political power kind of figure. But I had not heard these sort of I I, I never you know there was nothing kind of progressive or interesting about Cy Vance. Uh, but there also was not a a sort of reputation of corruption around him either. Yeah, I think he was kind of your your stock uh, you know family politician you know, bred for the office, district attorney. Um, you know, he, a couple of things he's been known for is he's been a proponent of, of gun control and uh, opposed to uh, digital encryption uh, technology. But other than that, he hasn't really taken any stands that have been uh, strongly publicized as far as I know. Uh, you know, it's like you said, he's just kind of this, uh, this standard stock figure. So now... In, in And all this is happening, and it, there was this bombshell. I mean, it was kind of odd. I mean, can it really be a bombshell? Of it, it seemed like knowledge of Harvey Weinstein as every type of monster imaginable. I mean, there's stories about him and, and rumors and everything else of, of him as someone who was, uh, you know, harassed and abused women sexually and otherwise. Um, there were stories about him physically, you know, abusing subordinates. There's stories about him not paying vendors. I mean, in, in many ways, you could say that, you know, Harvey Weinstein was a sort of bit self-made uh, and probably more genuinely talented 
kind of, you know, a, a Donald Trump who kept up Hampton's politics. Uh, but there were a lot of similarities. There was a kind of sense that, you know, that this guy was an out of control monster and that basically, you know, the New York Times finally put this report together and now it's going back decades in terms of these Weinstein abuses. Um, yeah. And the natural question was, you know, and and the smarter question, it was not to sort of, you know, beat up on, well, why didn't, you know, these women or other people who were abused as employees, why didn't they expose him? Well, I mean, that's kind of obvious why people might have been afraid to come forward or been sort of, you know, felt cornered into a legal settlement. But some of these behaviors were so flagrant and some of the accusations against him were, are literally like things that were like, you know, publicly assaulting somebody. How did this not get criminal attention? Well, this is where a new report that you guys put together comes in. Yeah, and that you know that was our first story into into Cy Vance, and we basically found uh, that Weinstein's longtime lawyer David Boys uh, gave ten thousand dollars to Vance's campaign um, a few months after Vance dropped the criminal investigation into Weinstein, uh, and and that investigation was specifically into allegations from. Uh, that the New York Times reported from uh, the Italian model Ambra Battilana, who uh, said that uh, Weinstein asked if her breasts were real, groped them, and stuck his hands up her skirt. Mm. Um, so a couple months after that, Boys gives $10,000 to Vance, um, but that was also only a fraction of the total amount that Boys, his son, and his law firm partners gave to Vance over the years, which totaled in excess of $182,000. Um, so it's true that, you know, a little wrinkle to this is that, uh, boys did not specifically represent Weinstein in that 2015 sexual assault investigation, mm -hmm. but he was Weinstein's lawyer for at least a decade before that, at that point. Um, and he clearly had a close relationship with Vance. Uh, you know, he had headlined a fundraiser for Vance previously. Um, so it still certainly raises questions about a potential conflict of interest and impropriety there, especially when we're seeing what starts to look like a trend in this pattern of behavior with Vance. Well, yeah, so you have the specifically the Weinstein case, but then the follow-up piece that you guys published um, on, the, on the 6th of this month um, is entitled Criminal Defense Firm Bankrolled Manhattan DA Cyrus Vance Kept Clients Out of Prison. So, I mean... How, what are the other kind of potentials, at least, of other kinds of cases we're talking about and, and the kind of broader set of campaign contributions? Well, it seems like, you know, uh, it, there might be a, a trend here of um, sexual assault crimes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so this, this, back up for a second, this law firm in our, our second piece, Clayman yeah. uh, and Rosenberg, they gave $42,000 to Vance's campaign, and several of their clients got... Um, extremely favorable deals uh, that involve no jail time um, and favorable deals, you know, as judged by, you know, other news outlets that were covering those cases at the time that were kind of surprised by the outcome of those cases. Um, so one of those cases uh, involves a gynecologist who sexually assaulted six pregnant women. Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, he got no jail time. Uh, and he had to only register as the lowest level of sex offender. Um, two months after that plea deal, uh, Clayman and Rosenberg lawyers gave $3,000 to Vance's campaign. Mm -hmm. And at the time that plea deal came out, uh, an article in the New York Daily News uh, said, it was not immediately clear why prosecutors offer him a jail-free deal that does not even require him to do community service or comply with probation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, Cy Vance is not known for uh, being somebody who, as an example, was, you know, criticizing harsh sent or punitive sentences for, you know, lower income people or people of color. He wasn't exactly known as a guy who was, you know, a crusading DA who wanted us to revisit the sort of punitive emphasis of our criminal justice system in favor of rehabilitation. This wasn't a guy who was out on the front line, you know, talking about <laughs> why we, he wasn't at the press conference with Bill de Blasio when Rikers was getting shut down. So there isn't even this, you know, uh, there isn't even some sort of corresponding, like, you know, this is just a DA who really doesn't believe, uh, 
you know that pr- that prison is is a sort of option of last resort for just public protection. This is someone no, who's quite happy to hand down punitive charges and send, and push for hard yeah. sentences. He wasn't, uh, you know, he certainly wasn't in any meeting of, of uh, prison abolitionists. And, uh, you know, in fact, there are lots of reports of him kind of maybe being a little overly harsh on uh, kind of broken windows charges like turnstile jumping and things like that. Right. So he's been t- totally on board with this sort of New York City, very, you know, Giuliani, Bloomberg tradition, somewhat modified by de Blasio of kind of using... Uh, you know, public ordinances, lower level drug crimes and things like that to essentially police, you know, communities of color and constrain populations and kind of create a New York that is safe and pleasant and very easy to manage for a serial sexually assaulting gynecologist um, so that he can avoid, you know, jail and go hang out in Gramercy Park or wherever he was. Um, what has been the response to both of these stories from the DA's office? I mean, it, it, what's kind of notable about this is that, you know, the kind of broader campaign finance system, we all know that obviously money uh, determines much of policy. And Congress, as an example, is obviously you know totally beholden to kind of a small sector of, of sort of corporate interests. Uh, that's kind of common knowledge. But at the same time, You know, usually these things are done in a little bit more of a sophisticated or bureaucratic or slightly subtle way. I mean, this this just seems sort of shocking how overt it is, especially the the uh, Ivanka and Don Jr. thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, talking to people about these cases or, you know, just seeing the responses come in to the articles on Twitter, I think people were even surprised to realize that. It's the same kind of campaign finance system we have for Congress that we have for district attorneys. A lot of people don't even realize that that's how our political system works and that the justice system is dependent on those same kinds of well-connected, wealthy donors. Um, are you looking at, I mean, are there, are, there, are there more shoes to drop with Cy Vance specifically and then taking off from what you said about... You know, and of course, in other parts of the country, I mean, judges are elected to office. There's been a lot of right. things in, you know, in the South of and, and other parts where places where judges are elected of essentially, you know, definitely local oil interests as an example, just dictating state Supreme Court decisions with their kind of like handpicked candidates getting elected to office. It's a very serious issue um, because obviously this is a realm where, you know, theoretically and platonically we're talking about roles that are not, um, that are supposed to be less quote unquote politicized. So are you looking yeah. more at Cy Vance uh, specifically or is this going to, or potentially open up to, you know, a broader set of investigations of DAs or judges or this kind of, you know, broader role of, of, of potential influence peddling in, uh, in criminal and, and other judicial type of uh, cases and policy. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can say that our, our investigations into Cy Vance's campaign finance is definitely ongoing. Um, and, you know, it, it's likely there will be more to come on that. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're certainly looking at the broader system beyond that. But for now, we're, uh, we're definitely focusing on, on side dance. What's he, what um, is he, of, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say in terms of the, uh, you know, the response from his office that you had asked about previously, yeah. um, you know, uh, I think maybe Friday or Saturday, there was a piece in the guardian, uh, where the DA office's spokeswoman, uh, Joan Valero, um, characterized our, our Harvey Weinstein story as uh, quote completely false, um, and I said, you know, that was really astonishing for me uh, to see when we were literally just reporting on public records. I mean, you know, as, as an investigative journalist, it's not like uh, this article was based on some leaked confidential memo or an insider tip or some you know shady underground garage meeting. Uh, It wasn't even drudged up through freedom of information requests. This is, you know, literally publicly available information that we just connected the dots between. So to have an official spokesperson uh, say my reporting is completely false is uh, is simultaneously baffling and uh, and really concerning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't I don't even understand. I mean, is there anything around those quotes that expands on that? Because I mean, quite. 
I mean, unless they were going to somehow prove that, oh, you know, sorry, this isn't Jade, you know, uh, you guys at, at, at International Business Times, this isn't even your fault. This stuff was just literally mislabeled on the public record, and we can see <laughs> how that looked weird, but we've corrected it, and the money actually didn't come from any of these sources, and, you know, here's the documentation. That would basically be the only way that you could say that, and then even then you would still be like, apologetic you know there's there's some problem at the sort right. of you know at the clerk's office or whatever yeah uh no they have not said that any of the records we reported on were incorrect or mislabeled or anything like that uh they she threw out a couple of kind of straw men claims that we did not make in our story mm -hmm. um, and said none of these things are true and to my which my response was just yeah we didn't say any of those things right you just you <laughs> just reported on a specific so so, yeah, I mean, if they're spinning that hard, there's probably obviously a lot more to come, and it really looks very, very bad. And I, and I think, you know, it's important. There's a Trump angle and that whole, you know, Trump family enterprise thing and, and this sort of broader criminality and stuff. And then there's also, uh, you know, the, the broader lesson to think of in terms of judges and DAs across the country. But there also is this real specific Manhattan angle of a time of in a city of such hyper inequality and a kind of playground for the hyper rich and like yeah. not all of it is just sort of you know policy and cultural favorability this is also like quite literally how it happens you know this is how somebody who is down on their you know this is how somebody gets held in Rikers um, without being able to see a judge for ages and is also, you know, potentially tortured and abused by guards and lost in a prison system. And this is how, you know, we have three strikes law uh, or, you know, stop and frisk and everything else. And then at the same time, uh, you know, some, some doctor can commit multiple sexual assaults and not go to jail. I mean, this is the sort of, this is the kind of nitty gritty and Harvey Weinstein. It's sort of like an open secret who he is. This is the kind of, nitty gritty of how it actually works in terms of the, you know, not even two tier justice system, basically just like, you know, uh, sort of actually two tier injustice system, essentially. Well, yeah. And the important thing I'd say for, uh, you know, all, all your listeners to know uh, in terms of that justice system is that everything that we described uh, in these articles is probably entirely legal. Right. Right. Well, Jay Cassano, International Business Times. Uh, everybody should read this reporting. Um, really appreciate your time as always, Jay. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Always good to be here. Okay, folks. Um, let's do, we're going to go, yeah, we'll go to the fun half. Go straight to the fun half. Um, we have plenty of sound for you. I'm going to call into the phones. The IMs are on. Uh, at 695 members for the Michael Brooks Show, uh, 95 patrons, yesterday we released a program on the illicit history of the CIA destabilization and Michael Manley's Jamaica in the 1970s. Michael Manley was a democratic socialist leader. Um, the CIA funneled weapons uh, into Jamaica to destabilize his government. There's a lot of stories it leads to from the kind of setting up of cocaine distribution networks in the 1980s in the United States, which uh, some things happened happening in the 70s led to, as well as stories about why Bob Marley was shot in 1976. We're doing a lot of you know stuff like that in terms of the illicit history part of the show. And you can find the history of Silicon Valley fascism, history of the third way, uh, the post game, everything. It's Things are really... Uh, growing and doing well and i'm excited for more and more people to check it out um and of course if you just want to check out the first part of the show get a flavor of it 7 p.m we're live tomorrow on tuesday and you can uh, always find the clips on the michael brooks playlist on youtube and you can subscribe to it on itunes at my michael brooks show and uh, check out i think we have about uh 100 and 123 or 24 reviews now on itunes and uh Thank you mostly. They're very favorable. So thanks a million, everybody. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, David Slavic. 646-257-3920. Um, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh.
Welcome back. We're on the fun half. I'm Michael Brooks with Maddie Alek. Okay. All right, Matt. I really like that Maddie thing. Maddie. He's a good kid. You're calling from a 509 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Oh, my gosh. This is Ronald Reagan's creepy uncle. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm just calling it. <laughs> Oh, and then to co- uh, well, I was listening to you guys on the on the commercial. I could hear you talking about Trump's new movie, uh, Trump Without Money. Trump Without Money. I think that movie's money. been done. What, what, is, what was the movie? Oh, at the end of it, he just sells out to the mafia and becomes president. So, No, 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 no. I'm not talking about doesn't have as much money as he's lying about. I'm talking about literally does not have money. I'm talking about the guy like doesn't Dad grow wasn't up. in real estate. Yeah, dad was not a, tr- he's not a trust fund baby. He doesn't grow up with money. He would be in jail. He would. Oh my God! He would either that would be, be, the be if somebody could convince him that would get good ratings, then he might do a Survivor Island <laughs> style reality show. No, no, he would. Not. That would be outstanding. He would not. No, I'm <laughs> thinking he would. I think the scenarios would be he might potentially be like a lower level mafia affiliate who either got went to jail or got clipped, like um, a Jack Ruby figure. Yeah. Or like Henry Hill's like <laughs> dumber younger brother if he existed, uh, or he would be in jail now for like passing bad checks, something like that. It's something any any one of us would already be in jail for. Um, well, I just want to thank you guys. Uh, I've uh, taken to listening to the Nixon tapes sped up at one and a half speed now, thanks to Matt Lack. Um, <laughs> nice. Bon voyage. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, just a big time support of the show. I'm trying to get the word out there. Um, I want to talk about gun control a little bit. I didn't get to hear most of today's show because I was working. But um, you guys really, uh, I, you know, I was ex-military, grew up. I got my first shotgun when I was like 12. Thank you, Dad. And Thanks, Dad. now I'm totally 180. I have kids. I'm terrified of weapons now. But uh, what do you think this uh, next step is going to be for the u.s the nra is you know they walk back a little bit with this bump stock thing is that just what's going to happen after every mass shooting they're going to walk back a little bit of uh, the insanity i don't is think that so. all we can hope for only where it's opportunistic <laughs> yeah like, only where it's opportunistic i mean you know my my thing is my my kind of angle on this is i just think that people make guns too much i'm not saying it isn't a cultural issue but ma- people make it way too much like it's like so many other things. There would not be like, there wouldn't, everything from a certain type of religious fanaticism here in the Middle East or like, there is a culture of guns partially that's organic and genuine and complicated to deal with. And a result but, of colonization. And the result of colonization and result of Southern history. Oh, yeah. I'm, and all I'm this stuff. from but, that culture. Yeah, but I, I mean, but I also just think, though, that even the reason, though, that you don't see any type of movement on guns is not primarily because of, of, uh, of people. It's primarily because of the power of the domestic arms cartel which keeps this country held hostage and owns Republicans, period. And also the way they're able to activate a small band of truly insane people uh, through things like NRA well, TV. I, I don't think it's that small. They activate uh, a base uh, you know, throughout rural America that's in the millions that totally believes their propaganda. Yeah, and it's in the millions. Uh, I, I mean, even bring nationally. It up with, a lot of, then, yeah. with a lot of my friends. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of the guys I was in the military with, I just can't talk about that issue with them because they are completely in the camp of no regulations. It's a safer world if everybody is carrying around a 240 Gulf. And that's insane. Yeah. It's, what about have you ever? What about other issues? Can you talk with them about other issues, or is that like the one thing that they're just completely crazy about? Yeah, that's actually one of the main hitches. A lot of them are more reasonable about a lot of things. Hmm. Um, it's just where they get into the personal defense kind of thing. And I was there I was there with them, too. I mean, when I got out of the military, I wasn't political at all, really, which is insane for someone who was in the military. But um, I, I was totally, uh, yeah, we can go ahead and call it libertarianism. I, uh, I was on hook, line, and sinker, man. Boo. It was gross. And so what's I, I wanted to call up? in and actually... Well, it was it, 
damn it, it was Sam Cedar's debates with libertarians. Like, wow. Cruising through YouTube and thought I was going to watch this little little guy beta male with his glasses get crushed by some hardcore libertarians and, and, then, and then all of a sudden that little beta male just, just, just fucking destroyed because he would be like <laughs> okay but what about clean drinking you know water? it's always and then they would be like oh well the connection's bad but if you want to have slavery that's freedom it's nice it's always nice to hear that because those things are very kind of interminable to go through every day <laughs> Like when yeah. we were doing a lot of those, oh. it hasn't haven't been in a while. But like, no, I think libertarians are terrified of the show now, and I also think libertarianism oh, I think isn't, so. isn't trendy anymore either. I think a lot of libertarian. I think I think what Con- would be confusing in- time for libertarianism. I think what would be interesting now is I think it, it had a tide. It followed the Ron Paul tide, and now it's reeling back. But that was that was a serious movement for a while. And I think people are either getting sane like you, or they're realizing like. The logic of where I'm going basically means that I'm I should just become a Nazi. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think like that's like that's yeah. where that's yeah, like how have... it's splitting up. The logical conclusions get a little scary. So uh, no. thank you guys. Appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Thanks, I'll boss. I'll call again later. Appreciate the call, man. Thanks. You're... Ronald Reagan's creepy uncle's not terribly creepy. No, not terribly creepy. You're calling from a 509 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Bro, is this Michael Butt from the Fake News Report? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dude. Dude. What the fuck? This is Donnie J. <laughs> Donald Trump Jr., everybody. What the fuck, dude? Well, what the Talking fuck? Talking a lot of shit today. I, I, yeah, well, I guess it did involve you sort of... Uh, not really even lucking your way, just kind of corrupting your way out of a corruption charge, huh? Bro, my dad is 6'4", 3'10", <laughs> and he's going to kick your dad's ass. <laughs> is your dad really How tall? How tall is your dad, bro? How tall is my How dad? How tall is your dad, bro? Oh, my dad's only 5'8", man. <laughs> Give me a break. That's kill me in size, bro. <laughs> he's about to get bit. <laughs> He's about to get bitch slapped by the ultimate alpha male, Don Senior, my dad, <laughs> bitch. Do you really get along with your like? I read a report. Uh, it was a Facebook post, to be fair, but it struck me as true that it was the day before, week before the election, I think, that you were really sad in college and you would basically just drink yourself like past the point of no return pretty much every day yeah dude yeah oh, but not like fun yeah. drinking like you weren't like the center of the party you weren't getting girls you just literally were like just drunk and depressed and one day you were supposed to meet your dad and you came out to meet him and he didn't like the clothes you had on and he smacked you in the face and told you to uh put on a suit is that true yeah bro that's what's <laughs> about to happen to your dad bitch. <laughs> Look, has my dad made me cry? Yeah, but I probably deserved it. And now I'm an alpha male, too. So no, you're an alpha male, too. Off. Look, bro, look, bro. Me and Jesse Waters are going to have these on a prostitute tonight. <laughs> I was going to invite you, and now I'm not. I'm, I'm talking mad shit. I'm totally okay with not so getting that invite. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Donald Trump Jr., also, by the way, that was we were talking the other day on my show about callers knowing how to land things well. Ending that with "Go fuck yourself" is a very solid land. Um, I just want to follow up briefly, in light of the Harvey Weinstein thing and and uh, and this sort of Joe Rogan conversation we were having the other day. There's this whole cluster of people, people that. You know, on one hand, I, you know, obviously I have no respect for like a Dave Rubin type. People like Rogan, who I think it, you know, I, it sucks. I think, yeah, he's facilitating a lot of our alt right garbage, but I have found him entertaining. I have found him interesting. I've enjoyed his show at times. Uh, and then this kind of whole broader cluster of people, like this guy Jordan Peterson, has become very trendy in this sort of 
kind of like soft neo reactionary YouTube. Um, and there's a lot of stuff to pick apart here uh, with this sort of obsession with, you know, campus culture and PC run amok and all of this stuff. And I think it's very easy if you want to. We can always identify some excess of a campus somewhere. More substantively, I think there's people who are on the actual left who are not opponents of social justice and understand that things like misogyny and sexism are in fact structural things that we need to overcome as part of any serious justice-oriented politics. But we have a critique of the kind of dumb wokeism of Twitter and BuzzFeed and there's a substantive critique and that's very important. Um, and that's the kind of part of that interwar between the left and liberals. Uh, but I just, I just, you know, was thinking in light of like, you look at the, these falls, you know, Harvey Weinstein, Roger Ailes, and just these grotesque, disgusting monsters who used positions, and, and Bill Cosby, I mean, you can put on the list uh, as well in a different way, but certainly on the list. Um, just in the sense that he wasn't a CEO. Um, but he was certainly someone who obviously had a lot of power and exercised it to systemically abuse women. Um, this sort that That's like the broader reality of this so-called out-of-control SJW culture. So for every like dumb story you could find about, you know, maybe this campus thing was stupid or maybe even in fact this argument about identity um, is actually problematic from a left perspective, not something that, you know, Rogan or Jordan Peterson is going to articulate, but they can, you know, find, hey, you know, some campus story that's, that's silly or whatever. Just remember that the broader trend and the broader context of a society that takes racism, sexism, structural abuse seriously is that we're just getting the, tiniest tiniest i mean because imagine the endless amounts of abuse as an example in terms of sexual harassment in a work environment that still exists that is not addressed the fact that we're even getting an inkling of it of an ales or a weinstein is definitely in large part due to the evolving standards of a society which says things like that are, pr are fundamentally unacceptable and that's the actual work. That's what the real conflict is over about a conversation about structural sexism as an example. It's not, you know, this professor tweeted something goofy. This argument about a video game. It's about, is it safe to work? <laughs> Are you being sexually assaulted at your profession? What kind of trade-offs do you need to make as a woman, right? And I just think that that's important to note as well. Because so many people are getting lost in reactionary arguments, but they're also just getting lost in really fundamentally trivial nonsense that even if we were to agree with, would still be at the bottom of issues to worry about. And the broader trend of pushing these issues to the forefront obviously is vital for overcoming real things, not like, Oh my God, these kids don't want Ann Coulter to talk at college. They are so sheltered. <laughs> but like, how did somebody run a major media conglomerate for several decades and abuse scores of employees? <laughs> What's that about? That's a serious thing. You're calling from a 512 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, Michael. It's Tammy in Texas. Hey, Theology Tammy. Theology OP on Twitter. We Hey. We talked last Tuesday? Yes. How you doing? I'm doing good. In the interest of uh, the fun half, just being the fun half, yes, I just want to say that I have given up my quest to be the last American female to get a cell phone. Wow. You got a cell phone? Uh, I didn't get one. Uh, an incredible guy, an OG techie and left-wing windmill tilter like myself gave me one as a gift. Oh, beautiful. So, uh, I don't know how I don't know how my levels are. <laughs> no, you're fine. If I sell, that's okay. Sound okay, fine. great. 
I, I wanted I wanted to call in uh, again because last Tuesday I was incredibly nervous. No, you were great. And you were. Go ahead. No, I just said you were great. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh. Well, what I was going to say is you were trying to engage me in a really important conversation and my heart was beating too loud for me to hear you. And it was a conversation about evangelical faith in the South and class. Mm -hmm. And essentially the alliance between, I don't know what you call them, I think of them as the Mm Horistocrats, W-H-O-R, the Horistocrats, the oligarchs, Uh the plutocrats, whatever Uh you want to call them. Right. But their alliance with religious conservatives in the South yeah. to basically create this, I, I would say, unholy alliance, but being an atheist, I'm not allowed to throw terms like those around. Um, what I wanted to say is, I, I am, I, I'm a Gen Xer, which means that I was born uh, right before the Vietnam War started. So I am pretty much aware of life through the period where the Republican Party made common cause in reaction to the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, where basically where I I lived through the period when Southern Dixiecrats abandoned the Democratic Party and made common cause with the Republican Party. And the people that midwifed that that movement Mm -hmm. from one side to the other were originally something called the Moral Majority, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which then became the Christian Coalition. And now we just think of as evangelical. Mm -hmm. And, oh, oh, this is really important. I got a little bit of pushback that I was basically slamming all Christians. And I just want to say, um, I will ally myself with anybody who believes in any faith or spiritual path who's fighting for what I'm fighting for. I greatly admire, I mean, I greatly admire Sister Simone Campbell of the Catholic faith. I greatly admire Reverend William, uh, the Reverend Dr. William Barber, who is, I believe, of the Disciples of Christ faith, which was my faith before my family moved into the evangelical church. Mm. But what I wanted to, to say is, when we talk about evangelicals in the South, you start to sound like a conspiracy theorist. I if you basically so. lay out the time, timeline, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I kind of start the timeline at the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act in '68. And then in the early 70s, you've got the Powell Memo, which basically lays out an idea that we need to deorganize working people, people who work for a paycheck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've talked. I mean, there's no there's no doubt that, you know, we we, we've yeah, we definitely talked about the Powell Memo. And if you go back also, I forget who wrote the book, but we had him on as a guest. He talked about right wing parties and democracy Um, He's a Harvard researcher. There, look. Yes, I remember that. Yeah, movie. look. There, and this is a global phenomenon. Look at Saudi Arabia. What's the, what's the relationship in Saudi Arabia? It's a royal family that sits on a massive amount of oil wealth, and they dispense patronage and allow a a degree, a high level of degree, a high degree of control of social policy to a religious establishment that is supposed to force and maintain social cohesion and confer, uh, you know, sort of religious legitimacy on this royal family, which is really just... Exactly. So, so that's, that's, a, that's a global pattern, and the only thing that the right has, because the actual policy agenda is simply to deliver economic benefits for a fraction of the population, all they have well, is to use the energy of things like religious fundamentalism or xenophobia or bigotry or different group identities to leverage normal people to vote for them. So that's a global, there's nothing conspiratorial about it. That's how it works internationally. But what I I guess, because I don't live anywhere, but where I live. And by the way, I lived in California for 10 years Mm -hmm. and absolutely hated the personality of the place. Mm -hmm. But but what were you going to say about, about Texas though? Well, I I live in the old Confederacy, mm-hmm. so my knowledge of like living through this change that happened to Texas and Ann Richards would not be possible now. Mm-hmm. Can, can we agree on that? Yeah, sure. 
She's okay. a former governor Good. of Texas for everybody. She was, uh, what was it, late, late 80s, early 90s? She was the governor? Total badass. Mm-hmm. Total, total badass. Total, like, in your face. I'm 100% Texan and 100% good people at the same time. Mm-hmm. That is that is all gone now. Mm-hmm. And I guess the thing that I'm that I just want to say is there is a kind of do not pity. Do not there's a lot of especially on the part of uh Bernie Bros, there's a lot of pity mm-hmm. for southerners who threw in their lot with Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. And there is this myth that they held their nose about Donald Trump's morality in order to throw in with him to get Gorsuch on the court and to get abortion made illegal, et cetera. Mm-hmm. That's a myth. That is a myth. These evangelicals didn't vote for Donald Trump in spite of their faith. They voted for him because of their faith. And, and let me explain what I mean. Mm-hmm. There is, there is a, a People think about the New Testament, and they think about Jesus' constant uh, red letters about the poor, and about the evils of the love of money, and about the necessity to sell off your, to not lay up, uh, to lay up stores of riches in heaven, not here on earth. And they they say, how could these people have voted for Donald Trump? Mm -hmm. These people have bought into something called the prosperity gospel heresy, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is an Old Testament heresy that says, in the Old Testament, God visited great riches and, and boons of sex and offspring and lands and cattle and riches on these great patriarchs of the Old Testament. Well, thank you. Were... Thank you very much. No, um, I, yeah, no, I, I'm familiar with that too. I think, I think, and we do have to jump in a minute. I think that the, the pushback, I agree with you partially. And I think that there is obviously a debate right now that isn't just about Southern evangelicals. It's about a lot of different types of people um, that I think actually get pushed together in ways that are unhelpful, um, to be honest. But yes, there's this basic notion of, you know, is one side essentially just, well, deplorable? Or is, you know, this kind of support for people like Trump misdirected populism or angst or even I guess in your case you're talking about people with just kind of genuine religious convictions about things like abortion which I don't frankly have much time for either uh I think the truth of the matter is is that obviously a vast majority of people who voted for Trump were as we always say this they're just Republicans and the Republican Party is a plutocrat social reactionary party of which Donald Trump is the perfect yeah. representative of now there is a, now there them. is well I mean I don't you know I I, I don't I don't know what's Do profitable this isn't the- I think I think that though it's what's important though is there is a chunk of people uh, that can be pulled off uh, and that's who we need to focus on and a broader rhetorical strategy that opens that ability is helpful um, whether we pity people or not. Uh, I don't, you know, pity means different things to different people. I don't pity these people, but I sure I'm interested in how the situation got as bad as it is and, you know, the context behind it. Um, I think that's all. Do you remember, do you remember when we talked about brainwashing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I do. Yes. The non-evangelical brainwashing that has taken place for the non-evangelicals, the brainwashing that has taken place is the wholesale purchase of this idea that our political and economic system means everybody can be rich. Right. People have been brainwashed to believe that. And they voted for Donald Trump, and this is going to sound bizarre, but I promise you it's not, it's true, because they thought he's going to get into office and tell us all the secret. Right, right. And make us all rich. Right. It is... Sack. And, and what I'm... What I'm yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, what I'm I, saying so, is... Yeah, just but real quick, because we do have to jump. You cannot talk somebody who believes that nonsense out of it. I, I agree with you that we need to come up with a rhetorical strategy. All I but we could probably talk somebody who it. voted that way in you know, Michigan out of desperation out of it. I don't think there's anybody, even my, you know, and speaking as a Bernie bro, I guess, whatever the hell that means, I have no illusions about flipping Southern evangelicals. My main political concern in the South is voting rights for people of color and attempting to organize, you know, the, the emergent reality of those places to overturn 
essentially white supremacy f fused with you know this very very toxic and deranged religiosity but i do think that as a message matter we need to be bold and confident and reach out to, to everyone and then we also need to make these distinctions because you know it, there is a very big difference and, and again not just i don't i think voting for donald trump as i've said a million times is an act of white supremacy in and of itself but somebody who did that in a sense of desperation in the industrial Midwest and have voted for Obama before is a radically different voter than the type of voter you're talking yeah. about. So that that's the kind of distinction okay. we need to make. But I, I do need to jump. Thank you so much for the call. No, you got to let me, you got to let me defend myself. You, no, I, no, look, you, you're, no uh, Bernie, you, you said I called you a Bernie bro as a pejorative. Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't bro. take, I didn't take it like that. Not at all. Not at all. No, no, What no. I mean when I say Bernie, I don't consider you a Bernie bro. Oh, okay. When I say Bernie bro, what I mean is people who say, if we can't have Bernie, Trump is, Trump is fine. Yeah, I think that there's definitely nobody, hope, I don't think anybody listening to this show would think that. That's a delusional position. Uh, but if, yeah, of course. Thank you so much for the call. All right, thank I'll talk to you again call. soon. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Um, Bye. Okay. So Senator Bob Corker, who is a, is that the clip you have up? Oh, this is the football stuff. Okay, let's do the football stuff. So uh, Mike Pence, who is just as despicable as Donald Trump, look into his record in Indiana on voter suppression. Look into his record on assaults on women's health. Look at his record going back, you know, as a, not only just a person who, of course, voted for the invasion of Iraq, he was a prime advocate of the invasion of Iraq. Um, he wants to get in on this uh, NFL uh, far-right virtue signaling. And how did he do that? Well, I, I don't like to frame things this way, but this was literally a... If, if you want to look at stuff like this, a hilarious, massive misuse of public resources and time and a craven display to get on the news cycle. And this is a, a CNN panel uh, breaking down the situation with Vice President Mike Pence. Um, all right, I also want to bring up uh, something that just happened uh, today at the NFL uh, at a game, Indianapolis Colts, Vice President Mike Pence uh, was there, uh, but then tweeting a short time ago that he left the Colts game over players kneeling uh, during the anthem and then writing this, I left today's Colts game because a President of the United States and I will not dignify any event that disrespects our soldiers, our flag, or our national anthem at a time when so many Americans are inspiring our nation with their courage, resolve, and resilience. Now more than ever, we should rally around our flag and everything that unites us while everyone is entitled to their own opinions. I don't think it's too much to ask NFL players to respect the flag and our national anthem. Uh, so, so, Brian, I mean, this kind of also underscores it's back to uh, the, the, the kneeling, um, yeah. the, the form of protest. So many players say it's not about the flag. Uh, but it is in, instead uh, a statement being made about social injustices, but the vice president underscoring that he sees it as an issue of the flag. So what is the message that's being sent uh, by the vice president tweeting this and refusing to be t at the game? In some ways, I think it's back to a culture war issue that Trump and Pence felt they were winning on. This was big news two weeks ago. It faded away. Now it's back thanks to Pence's visit. I've got to be cynical about this for a moment, Fred. The Vice President Pence was in Las Vegas yesterday speaking solemnly about the massacre there. Then he flew home to Indiana. He spent the night in Indiana. Uh, he went to the game today. He's about to head back to the West Coast. So it makes you wonder if he purposely wanted to go to the Colts game today in Indiana in order to make this kind of statement knowing that 49ers players were almost guaranteed to kneel. There's been players on the San Francisco team kneeling every single game. So Pence and his team heading to the game today, they had to have known there was going to be kneeling. His statement almost seems written ahead of time. Uh, it seems like this was a, uh, you know, it seems like it was a staged uh, moment for Pence to walk out, to make a statement about this. But clearly he feels strongly about these anthem protests. He wants... Brian, I'll help you. It was premeditated. It's lazy. It's pathetic. It's sort of so ham-handed and comically obvious what Mike Pence is doing here. 
that it's embarrassing for everybody involved. Well, and it's repetitive because this is what Pence did when he went to Hamilton too, right? Yes. Like it's sort of the exact same thing. I'm going to go someplace and be offended by the the people on stage that you know our voters can't identify with for whatever reason. And again, this just just strikes me in light of this like YouTube conversation that the left is like the party of the perpetually offended. Because we might say like, hey, I thought your comment about Puerto Ricans being lazy while we're viciously savaging them with austerity, not responding seriously enough to a catastrophe, I thought that was a fucked up thing to say. That means that like we're always triggered. But these guys will take a plane trip to intentionally choreograph offense about athletes exercising their free speech rights. Incidentally, to highlight an issue that, you know, I don't know, maybe being black and getting fucking murdered by a police officer is a little bit more important than Mike Pence's feelings or the feelings he's pretending to so deeply have so he can trigger his base. Because if you want to have a conversation about everybody being too reactive and too caught in a news cycle and too triggered, we can have that. But that's going to be about pretty much every American at this point. This country is in need of a global meditation retreat. But the notion that this is somehow identifiable with the left when a prime activity of this White House, when they're not trying to take away people's health care, give away massive tax cuts, killing civilians overseas or roll back, rolling back any progress on climate and anti-corporate corruption and public health, their prime mode of activity is white identity politics, cultural aggrievement, and finding things to be offended about. That's what, that, that is literally the only areas of competency that the modern right has. And it's a quite an impressive jujitsu. Uh, to make that a conversation about the left. Um, Follow-up sound here. This is uh, 49ers safety Eric Reed uh, talking about Pence and uh, calling Pence uh, what Pence did, what it obviously was. Uh, my honest reaction, does any, first off, does anybody know the last time he's been to a football game? Okay, with that being said, he tweeted out a three-year-old photo from the Colts game. So with the information that I have, Last time he's been to a Colts game was three years ago. So this looks like a PR stunt to me. He knew um, our team has had the most players protests. He knew that we were probably going to do it again. And so this is what systemic oppression looks like. A man with power comes to the game, tweets a couple of things out, and leaves the game with an attempt to, to thwart our efforts. Um, again, based on the information I have, that's, that's the assumption that I made. That's exactly right. And also, not only to, you know, he's, it's a PR stunt. He's exercising his power to try to oppress uh, normal citizens exercising their free speech. It's embarrassing. It's pathetic. How many, how many, do you, could you imagine the types of death threats that these players are getting? Okay. And the type of verbal and racial abuse that no doubt they get from the stands. And when Mike Pence does this, he's winking at all of that. And intensifying it. And intensifying it. It's disgusting. I mean, it's a, it's a sort of classic mode of Mike Pence of just utterly craven and disgusting, but also just sort of silly and pathetic at the same time. You're calling from a, it's it says plus 266. Are you, are you there? Is that me? That's you. That's me? Oh, God, sorry. No worries, <laughs> I man. Like I was just listening to a radio show there. Um, I'm calling from Skype. I tried to call your official Skype, but, uh, didn't work. I'm calling from Seoul. Oh, hey man. What's your name? Uh, my name's Matt. Okay. So what are you doing and, in Seoul, uh, Matt? I'm just a teacher. Cool. Very cool. Been living here for a couple of years now and, uh, I listen to your show every day. Oh, cool. Or just about. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though I'm Canadian, but, uh, I caught that. <laughs> It's good to keep tabs on what's going on in the U.S., especially when you're here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sorry. And I heard you guys wondering, um, you guys said it on the show the other day, what must it be like to be living in Seoul right now? 
and so I thought I'd call in and tell you what it's like. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, now I'm just a, I'm obviously a foreigner. I'm a bit clueless. I don't really speak the language and, and all that. But um, it's different here now, or it feels that way to me. Uh, I lived here for a couple of years now, and I lived here once before too, uh, many years ago. And uh, I had never occurred to me before that anything was going to happen with North Korea. Mm. I mean, you, you gotta understand just how like poor and weak that country is. Like, I was trying to find something to compare. Mm -hmm. It's got North Korea's GDP is like uh, half of uh, of Huntsville, Alabama. That was the closest U.S. city I could find for comparison. So, so the, the people, so, I mean, in, the, the people in South Korea like. Obviously, you know, they're they're developing a weapons like what North Korea is threatening to do and occasionally does do has some logic to it. Uh it's, you know, horrible, but there's a logic to it. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying in terms of anybody being like, you know, people have been kidnapped from Japan by North Korean operatives. There has been, you know, back and forths between mm -hmm. North Korea and South. So we here in the United States Yeah, have they're like, officially at war. have like nothing right now even remotely to worry about directly from north korea like if this thing that trump keeps hinting at happens it will basically just be like a horrific war crime that the united states visits on north korea and then the fallout would be on south korea and japan so i get but but somehow in the popular discourse in america there's the you know it's another kind of you know it's hyped up there's this real fear about this guy in South Korea, even though the threat is actually real, like the, like it could decimate Seoul, is there a more like, not that they aren't afraid and concerned about the North Korean regime and not afraid and concerned about, you know, whatever irrationality Trump has planned, but that are they also at the same time more aware that, of course, like the North Korean regime is vindictive and dangerous and horrific to its own people, but it's nothing like half the GDP of Huntsville. Like, it isn't this big, you know, <laughs> global monolith that almost starts to get presented with, to some degree, in the United States. I mean, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, yeah, I mean, the people here are, they're weirdly cool with things. They're weirdly calm. I guess it's just a, a matter of having been officially at war for most of their living memory, even the new president here. Uh, I mean, I don't know that he was born when the Korean War ended, mm -hmm. when the, Korean, the, the, the armistice was signed. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, so it's just what they've been living with all their lives, and they're weirdly calm about it. I mean, and I was too, and I didn't even know, for instance, until Trump was elected, I didn't know where my local bomb shelter was. Now I do. Um, <laughs> right. And uh, I saw a news story recently that most Koreans still don't know. I think they're... This is a real busy, high-stress country, and I think they kind of keep it out of their minds most of the time. Hmm. Um, and I think they're used yeah, to the idea. There's a surprising right. amount of like cooperation between South and North Korea. There's like humanitarian aid. Right. They've marched together at the Olympics and stuff like this. And right. you know, when things are calm here, they're pretty calm. Um, but right now, it's starting to feel a lot less calm. Right. Right. Uh, anything else to add? Um, not so much, but when I, um, I'll just say that when I hear it used as a political football in America, that concerns me because, I mean, when you think about who you guys have run your country right now, I would much rather if when, uh, Trump failed to live up to his tough talk about North Korea, everybody just let that slide. And I agree. I, 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 I think that that's a very... Yeah, every time else. I hear there's a certain type of hashtag resistance person that does it like, yeah, you're not going to get your wall now, huh? And it's like, shut the fuck up. Uh -huh. <laughs> you're trying to like yeah, make this guy feel obligated to, to fulfill his insane rhetoric. I, I agree. I, I think if we could all just say... You know, I think, frankly, the T.I. would be a much better apprentice host than you, Mr. President, and hopefully that will distract him. Uh, you know, long absolutely just to fill forget. his Twitter feed yeah. with just NFL stuff, something. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, that's all I had. To all right, um, thanks, boss. If, uh, Appreciate the call. If anything changes here, I'll call you back. Thanks so much. Bye bye.
Um, all right, let's do let's let's run through the sound. Um, so, Senator Bob Corker, um, and we'll, we'll let's start with the sort of Corker drama, and then we'll get to kind of some of the substance of the Iran deal. Senator Bob Corker is a very right wing. Uh, senator from Tennessee, he uh, is not seeking re-election. He was supposedly on the short list, and I do mean short, <laughs> to be Trump's Secretary of State. And apparently, if we reported a couple months ago, or we commented on a report a couple months ago, that the reason that Corker was not picked by Trump was at his, I believe it's five foot four. I've read that he's five foot five, but he lists him, or five foot four, but he kind of tries to, you know throw himself a bit more um and trump was like it's just not it's like luther strange is a freak here yeah freak here um so uh, bob corker though has has had tension with trump and it's recently kind of exploded no surprise because he's not seeking re-election i have no doubt that if bob corker was planning on staying into the senate he would still be essentially aiding and abetting uh, trump uh you know typical kind of more traditional just sort of far right-wing kind of business conservative guy um and uh he has said and this is from a report in the new york times that trump's recklessness threatens world war three in an extraordinary rebuke of the president of his own party mr corker said he was alarmed about the president who about a president who quote acts like he is doing The Apprentice or something. He concerns me. He would have to concern anyone who cares about our nation. It's a sh- and then uh, he went on to say that, in fact, Trump could get us into World War III. And he's referring, not I think, not just to the North Korea stuff, but actually also potentially to the Iran stuff. Um, and if Trump, in fact, does decertify the Iran deal, that's going to go that's going to he's going to have to deal with Corker's committee as well as having to replace uh Rex Tillerson if he does indeed fire him. I do think that Corker is genuinely part of the Trump is a fucking moron contingent. Um and it should not earn anybody high praise to recognize the obvious that of course Trump is a fucking moron. And here is a report um that kind of brackets it because of course with Trump everything got on uh, onto Twitter. An NBC uh, news report on the Trump-Corker feud. Tonight, piercing criticism of the president by a fellow Republican. Senator Bob Corker tweeting, It's a shame the White House has become an adult daycare center. Someone obviously missed their shift this morning. Those sharp words retaliation for President Trump's latest Twitter tirade, attacking Corker as a negative voice obstructing his agenda, and a coward who didn't have the guts to run for re-election. The president's budget director an hour earlier praising Corker. I think it's going to be fun to work with him, especially now that he's announced that he's not running for, uh, for re-election, because I think it sort of uh, unleashes him to do whatever he and say whatever he wants to say. <laughs> Corker, head of the powerful Senate Foreign Relations Committee, just days ago, taking this apparent swipe at the president's competence. I think uh, Secretary Tillerson, Secretary Mattis, and uh, Chief of Staff Kelly uh, are those people that help separate our country from chaos. So there you have it. Um, And this comes on top of, you know, Trump is still ranting about the Iran deal. Now, there's obviously a contingent inside the White House, and it is still the mainstream. Any Republican president, And I think, in fact, a guy like Rubio would be even more likely to ruin the Iran deal than Trump because he's fully, you know, he's just a sort of airhead bagman for neoconservative interests. What they tried to do during the Obama, and I mentioned this before, I'll just go over it again briefly. What they tried to do during the Obama negotiations um, and the the Kerry negotiations with our partners and the Iranian uh, government was to add these poison pills. So that that agreement was actually very strictly about the nuclear program and our uh and sanctions relief. It was a very direct and then of course once you're there building negotiations and building relationships and kind of cooling relations a bit, 
and giving a kind of modest improvement, there's always the possibility that that will have ancillary benefits for other areas of cooperation um, and other potentially shared sources of interest against, you know, ISIL as an example. But uh, it was not a global deal. It wasn't a deal about Hezbollah. It wasn't a deal even about missiles. It wasn't a deal about delivery systems. It wasn't a deal about you know, recognizing Israel. It was not a full package towards full normalized relations. It was sanctions relief and constraints on the nuclear program, which everybody, including the Trump administration, which has been certifying it under Tillerson, um, acknowledges that they have been following. And it makes sense that the small, quote-unquote, realist contingent or the small kind of occasional sort of shoots of some sanity around this situation in this administration um, would say something like this. This is from a hearing that took place uh, about uh, uh, last Tuesday in the Armed Sur- Senate Armed Services Committee. Senator Angus King, independent of Maine, asked Secretary of Defense James Mattis what he thought of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which is the Iran deal, whether the United States should stay in it or pull out. Secretary Mattis, very quick, short answer question. Uh, Do you believe it's in our national security interest at the present time to remain in the JCPOA? That's a yes or no question. Yes, Senator, I do. Thank you. And it's obvious why it would be the case. One, the deal is working, which means that from a U.S. perspective, Iran's uh, weapon, potential of a nuclear weapons program is, is significantly reduced and monitored and constrained. It's also a business opportunity as sanctions are lifted and foreign direct investment flows into Iran. There's Contracts for companies like Boeing to help rebuild Iranian air fleets for their airline industry, as an example. And then number three, it totally destroys. I mean, you have two examples now. If we pull out of this Iran deal, and then you look at the, in fact, what was a comprehensive agreement I'm not uh, that Gaddafi did make with Bush and Blair many years ago and was a main partner on terrorism. Which of course meant that he, along with Assad, was a partner in the global torture program um, in this so-called war on terror. Look what happened to Gaddafi. And the only logical lesson that a country like Iran can draw is we should have nukes. <laughs> and the supreme leader, while endorsing and allowing Rouhani to pursue negotiations, also said basically said something to the effect in Farsi of you can, uh, you can do it, but I know that they cannot be trusted. Well, <laughs> okay. And this isn't just Republicans. Every single member of the Democratic caucus besides Bernie Sanders voted on an Iran sanctions package. And he's not even a Democrat as so many idiots on Twitter endlessly point out to me as if that's something I'm supposed to care about. (laughs) Did you know that Bernie was the only person to defend President Obama's greatest foreign policy achievement and one of the sort of core building blocks not leading to an even next level of escalation? Why does he hate Democrats so much? Yeah, exactly. Of crisis and death in the Middle East. He's not even a Democrat! (laughs) I mean, yeah. Gee, I wonder why. Why would the most popular politician in the country not subcontract his political identity to a party that is so fucking unpopular that they're still less popular than the fucking trust fund baby fascist president? What the fuck is wrong with these people? I did a whole tour with fucking... Oh my God. What's it? I did a whole tour with Tom Perez. I tried to teach him how to do this shit. Look at that guy. He failed in all his fundraising goals. Now he's teaching a class at Brown. But meanwhile, you're fucking harassing me. <laughs> I should be retired in Sarasota and I have more energy than all these people, but yet you people... Everybody's the program. I don't care. Yeah. I don't give a shit about people. Yeah. 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 Tom Perez at his best when he's cursing. 
What happened to that? They went, they went through all this effort to make sure that Keith Ellison was not the NC chair. And apparently Obama worked the phones and all of this shit. And then Perez gets it, fails his fundraising targets, and is still there, but also like uh, teaching college Teaching course. at Brown. Yeah, teaching at Brown. I guess uh, Brown's nice. <laughs> I, I spent some time at Brown in college. Good people. Hookah bars. I don't like what, what the fuck. <laughs> and these idiots bitch about Bernie Sanders. It's unbelievable. Ugh. And all of them, I will say. I mean, th- this th- this is why. I mean, you know, it's not, it's like, I mean, the reasons that I will probably support Bernie Sanders again if he runs in twenty twenty are number one because, of course, I do not want women or minorities being elected office because I'm a socialist. So obviously, uh, no. But uh, number two, I mean, all these people, including people I like, like Elizabeth Warren, I really like Elizabeth Warren. I would like to, you know, if she could just expand the sphere a little bit. Warren, Harris, everybody voted for Iran sanctions. I know it was part of a Russia sanctions bill. I'm sorry. Sanctioning Russia again is not a fifth as important as preserving this deal with Iran. The the Warren president stuff, it, it just makes me feel sad because she's the type of person where I just like her to stay in the Senate and lock that Senate seat down and be good on the I think Senate. She could be, I think she could truly be a, a icon of the Senate and get a lot of good stuff done. No doubt about it. But I don't know. I don't mean, I, it's, it's funny. It's amazing. Like just the, the depreciation of talent. Cause I was thinking too, it's like the best centrist politician in the country is Jerry Brown. <laughs> it's like, not, it's like not even like, you know, it's, it's like, why is it that it's, it's these politicians in their late seventies, you're calling from a 610 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is uh, Chris from Pennsylvania. Hey, Chris. What's going on? Hey, um, I just wanted to talk about Navient. Talk about what? I did, uh, Navient, the Student Loan Corporation. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Those evil mm-hmm. bastards. Yes. Yeah. The sure. only thing, um, I do want to say that, uh, sorry, uh, JT Brown was the first hockey player that raised this fist and he already received death threats. So. Yep. It, it, yeah, you know, it's, but it's not about the, you know, it's not about the protest itself, right? Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, uh, but the Attorney General, Josh Shapiro in Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. uh, officially sued Navient. Good. And that's actually a bigger, like a huge deal because Navient is actually... Some of them, uh, one of its headquarters is in Pennsylvania. Mm. And you know, the other, I think it was like Illinois and Washington, they don't have it, like direct jurisdiction yeah. where Pennsylvania is. And if the CFPB is going to be completely like gutted in the next year or so. Then Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, yeah. Europe, yeah, it's kind of going to be up to Shapiro. And he wants like full restitution, and then to give back their profits and halt That's great. on all the loans and everything. So, That's really great. That's great. It's an important yeah, case. So I just need to bring that up, and I don't know. There if, should um, be universal student yeah. debt relief. Period. It would be great for the economy. It would do something for inequality, and it would punish these parasitic companies. There should be national student student debt relief, period. Done. There should be retroactive free college for anybody still dealing with loans, period. Yeah, and he said one of the things is that he decided to pursue it because the U.S. Department of Education has basically decided not to because they're on the side. Yeah, of course. Betsy's busy. Yeah, Betsy's got things to do. I mean, look, that, that the student, yeah. look, you could take the Department of Education as a microcosm of republicanism. What, what do you do? You go out of your way to support fraudulent online universities. You're going to do even the, of course, again, same with Obama, get rid of the, the most modest steps the Obama administration took to protect uh, former students from all of these predatory companies. And then where are you going to put your real attention? After, because all that stuff is great. You just don't have to enforce rules or relax rules, and then you and then you get to the real focus of 
discriminating against transgender students and relaxing rape rules. And then, you know, yeah. turn on Dave Rubin and, uh, you know, find out that the fact that, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, Ben Shapiro had to like relocate a talk or something is the, you know, main crisis point in Western civilization. Uh, yeah, there, there are, there are threats to so-called Western civilization's achievements, but real achievements like free speech and open society. And, and it, it's called conservatives. It's not, not a fucking refugee from Syria. I appreciate the call, man. Thank you. All right. Can you tell Cliff, stop retweeting Evan McMullen? <laughs> you tell him that. Yeah. Tell him that. Tell him that. He didn't respond. I kind of he didn't respond. <laughs> well, all I can assure you is that I will not retweet unless I am quote tweeting and insulting Evan McMullen, David Frum, Jennifer Rubin, or who else is on the list of these of these <laughs> horrible people that all of a sudden get to be uh, okay. Albright. What Sally Albright is that? Oh, him? Sally Albright. She's, she's a whole she's, other. She's a. She makes you know. She does. She makes like. David Frum looked like a paragon of sanity and virtue, and she's not as important as those people. Uh, but I will not be retweeting any of them. All right, thank you, man. Um, speaking Bye. of you know Ben Shapiro needing security to go to campus events, yeah, uh, you know it struck me reading the Milo expose that Antifa tactics regarding you know heightening the tensions and you know they forced Mercer to put his security with Milo. That's, That's right. explicitly one of the goals of Antifa and roughing those crowds up is yeah. to like force their hand and like need them to sort of expose themselves. And it worked. So just like to register that. I know. It's a really good point. Uchi Wally, how are you going to com commemorate Che Guevara's death? Matt, what do you have in store for the day? Uh, I'm going to produce some podcasts today. <laughs> I'm going to produce some leftist podcast content. If Che were alive today, he would be a podcast producer. Um, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to smoke a Cuban. Uh, hang out with some people, drink some rum. No, I don't know. I don't know. I'll, I unfortunately will probably be... I have dinner plans and then I have to do show prep for my show tomorrow. That's what I'll do. <laughs> <laughs> uh chris lapaco trump said they turned down the cheering so people could hear the announcements does that mean that the cheering was recorded and being played through speakers i don't know that no sound he's weird. he's always yeah. talking about how it plays on camera so they have like the right. the room mic and the pa mic and he's very very paranoid about how <laughs> he's i mean he does this all the time about how they're playing that yeah they turned down the they turned, turned down, down the applause. Don't it was in the room. That. You couldn't even hear. They're breaking out their recording equipment. People cheering too loud for don't their want, paper towels. Yeah, didn't want you to see that. The people of Puerto Rico. They love when you say that. They really like Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. <laughs> Puerto Rico. <laughs> this guy is such trash. Jesus Christ. Um. Uh, colonial, colonial company, uh, companies. I'd like to see Trump give an example of something he thinks he's done, quote unquote, badly. Toile de papel. <laughs> Teacher BB, is there also a Trump angle to the van story in that the default now is to say the media lies, even in cases where you're caught lying? Very disturbing. Yeah. Well, it is. I mean, there is that evolution of like all politicians lie and distort, but even, even right wing media, like I've tried to make that point that like when I first like watch Fox and stuff, they lied all the time, of course, because it's a propaganda network, but they had to like, it was like a mid statistic lie about, I mean, you know, they, people still do this all the time, but it was different from, but now it's like, you know, just make up worlds, you know, like Jones, Cernovich, like it just, just Breitbart. That's just, it's just a complete. So I think that, yeah, like what would be like, what would the equivalent would be like Monica Lewinsky never heard of her. You know, it wouldn't be like definition of is, is it would just be like, I know that I said that I didn't say that. An optimistic read on this dynamic is that it, 
there's it's never been easier for a lot of this shit to rise to the surface and become public because there's so many outlets it's so easy to get information like think of how much of obama's admin is dominated by snowden and manning leaks right and so you have to just if stuff's going to get out you just have to discredit the messenger it's it's coming from a sign of weakness i think like i think i think there are like very powerful people like weinstein for instance the right. o'reilly ales like all that stuff they realize like just people in general that have shit to hide but they're powerful that we are entering a new time of like sort of forced transparency and it's not necessarily positive in every way but it's definitely different and people have to react to it and there are positive aspects of it obviously definitely um nick from san francisco I don't think Harvey Weinstein has ever assaulted anybody. In fact, no woman has been genuinely assaulted since the mid-1970s. And I'm a progressive. Joke. Yes. That was the uh, Waz and I's Fox News pitch. Uh, say Harnimer. Um, hey, Michael, longtime listener and became a member last year. Will soon become a patron of your show, too. Well, thank you very much, my friend. The TMBS Army. Interesting discussion on Vance. And speaking of fucked up DAs, not sure you know this, but here in LA, in LA, we have the most murderous police department in the country. I did know that part. Neither the police commissioner nor our DA, Jackie Lacey, have ever held these uh, killer cops accountable. During her term, Lacey has failed to prosecute almost 300 cops in the past four years. This includes the murder of Keisha Michael and Marquintin Sandlin, Loving parents of a seven-year-old who was killed, who were killed while sleeping in their car. Fucking disgusting, right? Yes, that is fucking disgusting. So we have a petition going to get the DA Lacey to do her fucking job. It's um, it's bit. dot l y slash b l m l a caps b l m l a. Can you post this, Matt? Would you mind? Yeah, bit.ly slash BLMLA. Yes. Um, yes, we'll post that on the blog, definitely. Um, especially if you're in LA, but really anywhere, please sign. If you can get some, if we can get some progress in eliminating the most murder, murderous forces, then there's something that could have a butterfly effect throughout the country. Thanks. Bit.ly slash BLMLA. We'll definitely post that. Thank you. That's really disgusting. Epish. Harvey Weinstein is a big Robin Hood Foundation guy, isn't he? Yep. A whole lot of interesting names on that Robin Hood Foundation board. Send that to me. That'd I've not heard of the Robin Hood Foundation. It's sort of a, I mean, it, it sounds, it's a great name. I'm a big Robin Hood fan. Uh, no, but it, it's kind of like, it, it's basically, you know, it's sort of a kind of liberal plutocrat sort of organization, essentially. Great to hear from Texas again. I check. I suggest you all check out Kevin Cruz's One Nation Under God. A lot. Yep, we we had him on the show. A lot of capital appropriation of religious and cultural space has to do with blocking labor's use of church for organizing. Absolutely, and undercutting social justice and religiosity. Look at what happened to the Barrigans. At least Dan was able to live quietly up at Fordham and wasn't murdered like MLK and Malcolm X. Just to be clear, your conversation from last week was great. I was saying that I thought we saw things similarly. Yes. Uh, Epish is a kneeling a microaggression. Exactly, that's what Mike Pizzo. Oh, such a microaggression against the flag. Joseph Ballin, with the recent revelation that Trump would decertify the Iran deal, I don't know if that's confirmed yet, but it's certainly looking like it. Label uh, label the Iranian Revolutionary Guard terrorist. Yes, organization fight with Tillerson over back channels with DP uh, RK. The Thad missile sales to Saudi Arabia and accusing Iran of funding the DPRK. It's painfully obvious the fascist Trump is clearly preparing for war with either Iran or North Korea, both at the same time. The tension. I also don't appreciate your attack on Jason Unruh. I am very concerned about those moves as well. Jason Unruh is uh, not good. <laughs> He's just some sweaty bastard on youtube uh comrade jeb have you seen the new racist dove ad i did uh that is so it's so racist it's such a brand f up as we would say in two dope boys in a podcast parlance that like like it's what it's one of those classic examples where even as a comedy sketch you'd say that's too on the nose 
It drives home the point of how widespread racism is within the corporate world that supposedly got past entire ad copy teams, legal teams, and various other proof processes. Here's an ad if you ha- here's the ad if you haven't seen it. Uh, I don't have a way of sending this to Matt, but um, do you want to just want to grab that uh, that Dove ad? Uh, we'll do it tomorrow. Okay, uh, but yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, Shield Jaguar. Is there a reggae version on La Poupée for Michael Monday? Yeah, that's a, that is a good point. It's a very good point. Actually, they're. Pr- I'm just. Ge- I have no idea. Seems but I'm like guessing there, there probably be, right? is. Yeah. Seems like there would. Be. I feel like there's a law. That yeah. Was passed for like the recording industry or something. I want like a late '80s like LA gangster rap version of it too. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony for Baltimore you probably already saw this but Betsy DeVos is giving a commencement speech for the graduating class of University of Baltimore this year which is my alma mater anyway Kurt Schmoke UB, UB's president and former mayor of Baltimore oh Schmoke's a pretty interesting guy right reached out um, apparently suggested that Trump Education Department LLC reached out to him initially to have Betsy speak at the commencement ceremony perhaps to deflect responsibility this is just a rumor, though, but Schmoke, oh, he's a proponent, oh, but Schmoke, who's a proponent, I had only heard of Schmoke, I thought Schmoke had called for drug uh, legalization, but this makes him sound terrible, but Schmoke, who's a proponent of school vouchers, has a cousin that used to be president of DeVry University, an online scam for a profit college that is part of the Trump Education Department, LLC. Schmoke refuses to rescind the invitation to Betsy DeVos following a student walkout a few weeks ago on the basis of supporting, quote-unquote, free speech. They will likely be protests the day of the ceremony. I hope so. And Schmoke should be fired. That's disgusting. Cuck the police. If Trump didn't have money, he would have been drafted and died cowering in a hole in Vietnam. Yes, that's very possible. Uh, Bull Prague, although he might have uh, failed some psych tests. Bull Prague. Uh, Todd Glass describing being PC is not saying something because you won't want to deal with the backlash rather than legitimately not saying some saying it, but put the blame on the others for why you don't say it. Okay. I mean, look, I, I have no, like, I have a critique of all of this sort of, for lack of a better word, kind of pseudo woke discourse. Those are some themes that in some case I probably explore a lot more on my show, but and and some of these conversations are important and there's also and also it's a world you know there there's there's an important critique of someone like Tani Hisi Coates that needs to be made there's also an incredibly stupid critique of him that questions the reality that of course America is a white supremacist country and of course there are through lines of materially grounded racism and apartheid in the United States if you can't accept there's a lot of debate to be had about so-called PC stuff. But if you can't accept certain historical realities and ground rules of experience, then you're just either deluded and wrong or you have the different political agenda than I do. And if you're just sort of obsessed with these relatively trivial conversations, I, I just think you know we're doing different things. Uh, Petrus revances his story. Whatever story like this comes out, it's always surprising how little it takes to buy these people. I guess if you take a little, yeah, exactly. I guess if you take a little from here and there, it adds up. Re Weinstein, I don't know the particulars of the situation, but Hollywood has its own ecosystems and rule sets. As long as everyone gets what they want, they're cool with abuses. I'm not defending Weinstein's misbehavior, but Jenny from Texas wants to get ahead. Oh, I don't agree with that at all. <laughs> I don't agree with that. Uh, Nick from Manitoba. Hey, Michael, great interview, great composure, and intellectual finesse. Your composure was excellent, I thought. I thought that Jay was very difficult, and you... (laughs) Right, exactly. (laughs) Jay was unhinged to work. Now, I just want to tell you in advance that Sam isn't here today. I might uh, make you the butt end of free jokes in my future uh, IMs in order to boost Sam's self-esteem. It's nothing against you. You know how to bring it. It's just Sam, on the other hand, with these pressing times, needs his petty, pretty, his petty ego to be tickled sometimes for the show's sake, to say the least. Stay sweet, MR Beauties. Well, maybe I need my ego stroked as well. Don't pit Sam and I against each other. We do enough of that on our own. Uh, Sam uh, underscore, oh, pfft, Sam, I don't even understand, Sam C-Door. 
Hey, Michael, this is Paul from Switzerland. I wanted to congratulate you guys on your fifth award. I love your show, and I feel it really deserves it. Thank you. I have a quick question. In addition uh, to the fact that we Swiss don't give a shit about our neighbors and will never help our friends, yeah, Huntsman is right. <laughs> We have a direct democracy. Unfortunately, as in most countries, the older generation voters much more than the younger ones, and therefore the country leads more conservative and right wing. And this is what we've seen recently in most European countries, Brexit, etc. Do you think that there would be a system where younger voters Do you think there should be a system where younger voters should have more weight than the older voters? I know this initiative here to do it, but it completely failed. What's your opinion of it uh on that? Love the show. Left is all that's left. That's a good slogan. Uh, I don't believe, I guess, in any actual principle that would specifically weight a vote more than the other. I'm interested in a lot of different voting reforms. I think actually, I mean, I don't know what difference it would make, but I, I'd be really interested in testing out vote, lowering the voting age to 16. Um, and uh, voting needs to be a national holiday in the United States. Like there, There's things that are obviously global patterns and lower vote turnouts. And I think a lot of it does have to do with uh, you know, shrinking choices and other kind of global patterns. But the thing in the United States is like, how could we even compare? I mean, we put so many barriers to letting people. I mean, I, I, I found myself personally that just in the busyness of my life, not having the obligation of a family and all this stuff. It's like, it's hard. You know, like the fact that it's not a, a national holiday and that people are not just facilitated to vote is the lane of attack we need to have. And Bonara... Although I would admit it would be better if there were unnecessary, it is also needed in every single field of my life. What about a version of Rate My Professor, which focuses on the movie industry, Rate My Director, Producer Director, and the specific ratings from women on the degree of particular abuses? I mean, maybe. I don't know. I, I There was a great piece, I think, by Kate Press in the Jacobin called Solidar I, I, Solidarity being the only answer. Like, there does need to basically be, like, Union protections and worker solidarity and protection across industries. This is the type of thing like that happens when you're not collectively protected and legally protected. Uh, I don't know how something like that would work. Uh, Ron Reagan, tell the other 509 to tweet me and we'll get lunch. <laughs> I don't think that's the real one, but we'll see. Twisted Tea Cozy, regarding sponsors, the only life insurance policy I need is a set of Harry's Razors. Ooh. Also, isn't the most eco-friendly undies arrangement just to go commando? Well, I guess if you're that... Um, if you're that rugged, go for it. Umar Shami. Being naked entirely is probably the best Yeah, option, being right? naked is probably the most eco thing you could do. On Friday, uh, Umar Shami, on Friday, Sam talked about a ratified realm that billionaires live in. A couple of anecdotes regarding that. The new um, Bugatti Chiron uh, hypercar just went on sale. The entire run of approximately 214 cars have sold out. On average, when the buyers receive their Chiron, it will be the 43rd vehicle in their garage or garages. Yeah. If you see one of those on the street and you're carrying like a big bag of sugar, just feel free to uh Yeah, just give a little sprinkle into the gas. A little sprinkle into the gas. Just a little just a little or a Beverly Hills cop, maybe banana in the tailpipe. Maybe. What does that do? Just I mean I guess it's well, I would watch Beverly Hills Cop. Okay, I'll find out. It's like um, Mythbusters. Like <laughs> I think it's just it's like sugar. Nothing too dramatic. Of course we're not actually advocating that. No, no. I would I would sort of more frame it as a, a thought experiment. Yeah, just do a thought experiment. Just do a thought experiment. When you see it. luxury cars. <laughs> yeah, just do a lot of thought experiments. You're calling from a uh, you're calling from a five one eight area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, okay. Uh, I'm calling in through Fire RTC, so I never really know what area code it is. Um, I'm calling in from Germany. I called in like. Two weeks ago, uh, Jacob is my name. Hey, um, Jacob, how are you? Everybody uh, remembers the, you. Yep. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yep. Um, I think you're a bit short on time, so I'll stick to just a little uh, anti-fascist uh, story. Okay, um, great. Um, I really, uh, usually I uh, don't condone violence, but there is uh, th there are occasions, you know. Um, <laughs> one of these occasions um, yes. is... Um, have been told to me by an old comrade. Uh, his name is Kurt Goldstein. He was a 
fought in the Spanish Civil War, and he oh, wow. he was like one of the original anti-fascists, basically. Um, and um, I had the great fortune of seeing him while he's still alive, while he was still alive. And uh, the story was like this: he was in a socialist pub, and a Nazi came in, and um, he was also Jewish, and asked, "Do you serve Jewish wine here?" And he didn't say a thing, picked up a two-pound ashtray um, of glass and smashed it over the fascist's head and ran out. Nice. And so, well, you know, I, don't, I do not condone it every time, but I think there are, you know, there are occasions. <laughs> <laughs> thank um, you, thank you for the call. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Have a great day. Have a nice one. Please call it and call in. Uh, yeah, please call in more. Thank you. All right. Let's get to this last piece of sound. Um this is Russell Brand talking with Bill Maher on voting strategy in the left. I, I have a soft spot for Russell Brand. I've always, you know, obviously I disagree with, you know, either not voting or not sucking it up and voting for awful candidates, whether they be, you know, Clinton or Macron, if it means averting a Trump or a Le Pen. But I do think actual that, fascism, actual fascism, exactly. But I do think that it's, you know, I think that. Uh, brand articulates a perspective that is you that is useful to uh it's going to be an important part of our kind of rhetorical and strategic approach moving forward uh on the left and this is here he is talking with bill maher you have expressed reservations about voting itself where are you on voting now well bill i think <laughs> <laughs> The dominant political parties have a real obligation, as Harold was just explaining, to present the voters, by which I mean human beings like me, real <laughs> vision, real possibilities, and to transcend the idea that they are merely managers of bureaucracies whose role it is to prevent us being, hmm, I suppose, uh, bludgeoned by lunatics like the current one so uh, I, I feel that what but we you would agree that it would be better if people had voted for hillary clinton right yes i i, I wondered if Come you would on, ask me that please well, look, we're, we're getting along do you so think good. like <laughs> if hillary clinton would not be pulling out of the iran deal or the paris climate deal or it's really you know i respect you and i admire you very much and i think you're a courageous man one of the problems I have in instances such as this is that politics became so centralised, realistic opportunities weren't offered to ordinary people, and when a candidate like Bernie Sanders emerged, he was not given the opportunities that he deserved. I never voted in my country. What do you mean he was not given the opportunities? There was a he, he was given every opportunity. He ran in America. People voted for him, not as many as Hillary. I wonder why this occurs. Because I mean, you're talking now about the manipulation of boundaries and borders and, and the way that certain but, political okay. figures are managed towards but, positions positions of power and authority. That exists at a party political can, can level. I, can I, the Democratic Party had preferences. Their preference was Hillary. You got Hillary. Hillary lost. And we... And I, I, I don't think that... Do, this is not... I'm, I think you can tell from a glance that I'm, like, not a Donald Trump guy. No, no, no. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to come to common ground with you. I just, oh, let me give you one example from, yes, the, from this week. While all the craziness was going on, yeah. the Republicans did not reauthorize a program called CHIPS, Children's Health Insurance yes. Program. Appalling. Yes, you know of it. Okay, it's been there for 20 years, bipartisan. Nine million kids now are not going to get, you know, what they need, the doctor visits, checkups. Yes, this is true. So I think for those people, voting matters. You are quite it's right. E it's easy to say, oh, voting yeah. and who can, they're all bad. But the, for those people downstream, it would have mattered if he didn't, wasn't president. I entirely recognize I had a okay. comparable problem in our country because I'd advocated not voting. I said, well, don't vote until they give you realistic are realistic opportunities until there are politicians that speak directly to you, that speak for ordinary working people. Until then, why would you participate in this spectacle? You're being invited to participate in something that doesn't offer you realistic opportunities. The candidate for the left at that time was, uh, in the, I would say, a comparable candidate, someone that was a neoliberal centralist politician that didn't oppose the corporate interests and elite interests. This allowed hegemony to continue. Now, I think that if the left doesn't, isn't brave enough to occupy the space where 
where ordinary people whose lives are in difficulty and in uh, tr trouble, if, if a politician on the left doesn't say, we are interested in representing you, we want to take care of you, ordinary Americans, then the bizarre, lunatic rhetoric of a man like Trump is suddenly appealing. We have You're witnessed right. this. The alternative is in the United Kingdom that Jeremy Corbyn, okay. a genuine socialist right. candidate, has come to the front, <laughs> and I voted for the first time, and people care What now. were you like on cocaine? <laughs> No, oh, that's a decent Bill Moore line. What be like? And cocaine. I think that it's a very important conversation because I think, of course, like in the narrow sense, Bill Maher is right. But the key word is the narrow sense. So what people are going to need to do is synthesize those two positions. And I think, you know, Brands is already getting there. And in fact, if I recall correctly, he didn't, in, you know, he didn't finish the story, but I think he actually did advocate voting for Ed Miliband in 2015. Yeah, he might not have voted himself, but they had yeah. like a YouTube live stream from his kitchen. Together. Right, he brought, Il exactly, he brought Ed Miliband on his YouTube show. So even then he was recognizing that of course, and, th and, this, is, and this is the perfect balance. The perfect balance that needs to happen is uh, voting can often be an incredibly, I mean, look, I have the opportunity in my city council race coming up here in early November, I'm very excited to vote for Jabari Brisport. Uh, he's a, Demo a, a democratic socialist, a green, and he has incredible plans on uh, gentrification, on housing affordability, on the environment, on policing. I want him in the city council, and he can be in the city council. That's an affirmative vote. Voting for Bernie Sanders is an affirmative vote. Voting for Jeremy Corbyn is an affirmative vote. But... There's also just the obvious that you vote to minimize the damage and you vote to make sure that 9 million kids stay on a fucking health insurance thing. It's grotesque that that's even a question. But then on the other hand, we must not narrow our conversation to that. We need to push the, the boundaries of what is expected from politics, what politicians offer, and never settle for the type of centralized technocratic mediocrity that Brand is talking about. So I, I think he, I think Russell Brand's actually getting to the right place. And I, th I just wish that somebody could answer the Bill Maher question with, yes, of course, Hillary's better than Trump. What's next? <laughs> what, do you, what do you need to do to improve our lot? Do you think it's just sufficient to vote for a minimally better, you know, a, 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 well, not very better, but pretty awful neoliberal who's not going to, do anything fundamental on climate inequality and foreign policy and just avoid fascism and then you can go just keep minding off while most of this country inc continues to sort of brutally suffer in the world do you think that's good enough bill answer the obvious and then go on the offense but as long as you can't answer the obvious you're not going to look credible because if you can't get that hillary clinton's better than donald trump i mean come on then that's when we get into just some fucking dumb dumb shit uh, you're calling from a 651 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, uh, this is Tiffany Trump. Yes, the <laughs> Tiffany Trump. Um, <laughs> hey, is Bill Maher coloring his hair? Probably. Did you notice that? His hair, his hair looks weird. Uh, he should cut that out. Hey, uh, uh, Donnie Jr. is a dick. Okay, uh, out of yeah. all the kids, dad, dad always loved Donnie Jr. the most platonically. And my dad and me, we weren't too close, right? Like, we never really dated, more like friends with benefits type of deal. But, like, when we spent time together, it was special. Like, right. I, thought, I thought we had a deeper connection, right? And then so one time, it was like right before I got off heroin, um, I was on a bridge. And my friend had killed herself. So I was on a bridge. I was about to jump into traffic. And uh, I called my dad, and I was looking for help. And he just asked if I was the slutty one. And at that point, I jumped into traffic, and I ended up in a body cast for six months. He never called me one single time, but at least I got off the smack, okay? So, anyway, I don't want to hear uh, any whining. Well, I guess Donnie Jr. is an alpha male now, so he's happy about that. But, you know, I'm still the slutty one in Dad's eyes. Hey, uh, did you see that Ben Shapiro tweeted? I, I tweeted you guys this. Ben Shapiro uh, posted one of the most racist cartoons I've ever seen. Scene. Oh, it is ridiculous. It surprise. seems like something funny or die would do. But anyway, uh, it's 47 seconds. So if you got a chance to take a peek at it, I would suggest it. Have All a right. good day, everybody. And fuck you, Donnie Jr. All right, bye. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> you're calling from a 216 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is David calling from Michigan. Hey, David. Can't hear you too good, man. You're not on speaker, are you? 
Hi, this is David calling from Michigan. Hey, David. How you doing? What's on your mind, man? Real good. Um, yeah, I've been having a lot of time to think about, you know, what's gone wrong in the country. I had one thought. I don't know if uh, it's uh, been discussed before, but I feel like uh, the country usually had a purpose to it. And if you think about the beginning of the nation, there was establishing a democracy. Then there was mastering the continent. Um, then you moved on to sort of shared prosperity coming mm-hmm. out of, you know, going from the labor movement into FDR and Truman mm-hmm. and all that. And mm-hmm. anti-communism. And, yep. you know, there's always been something. I'm not sure what it is right now besides possibly the stock market. Uh, I think you know, my candidate for this is, uh, it's, I think it's eventually going to be climate change. I think it will be. I think yeah, also, I mean, you should you should check out um, the interview that I did probably, I don't even remember now, several months ago with Scott Atron. And Scott Atron studies terrorism and sort of group mm-hmm. meeting and how it leads to terrorism. There's a lot of overlap with why people be attracted to the alt right. And yeah, there's no doubt that you know the the uh, life is not you know purely a materialistic kind of consumer experience. And if that's all you have to offer people, I do think that there is some lack of a certain sort of sense of collective mission and that's another problem of neoliberalism yeah that's, yeah so i would check check out the scott it. the scott atron interview Th- thanks so much for the call man yeah appreciate it um you're calling from a 617 area code who are you where are you calling from hello 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 Mikhail. uh how are you Tavarish? Oh, by I'm, the way what's your dad's name just he, what he, humor me really fast what's your dad's name Glenn. This is first. What? Glenn. 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 Ah, uh, Arusha Glenivich. Glenivich, how are you? Surviving <laughs> life in hell, yeah? Uh, how much money you paid to receive special lady Trump urination? Oh, okay, sorry. Thanks what? for humoring me there. <laughs> I totally but, missed that. Okay. Hi. Yeah. hi. You're calling it's from okay, Kiev. It's okay. I was just being silly. No, no yeah. problem. Hi from Ukraine. Hey. Okay. What's, what's but on your I'm mind? Just, no, I'm just using, yeah, just um, the... Uh, Patronymics. It's like what you, you call people their fir- their father's first name and then a suffix. Oh, okay. It, it, it's just what they do. Yeah. So it's, you'll get used to it. Don't worry. Um. Uh. Yeah. I guess I put up a link on the on the Discord about uh, from an article from Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty. Uh, first, I'm just curious. Do you have any opinions on RFE slash RL as a publication? Like you personally seem to like. Wait, you're talking about wait, well you're read. talking about the Discord on on Michael Brooks show. You're talking about yes, yes, yes. No, but I'm oh, I'm just okay. curious in general. Do you have any take? What I don't. Any I do, I would. I not strongly to be honest with you. I don't. I would need to know okay. more. I mean, I've occasionally read. I'm. All I right. know that name, but I don't know that much mm-hmm. to be honest with you. Okay. All right. No worries. Actually, just the article. Side note. Um, Maybe it's a bit obscure about Turkish academics in Kazakhstan, like not being stripped of visa and residency. Just as it's basically they're punishing people there for as it's kind of a proxy war mm-hmm. of war between Turkey and Russia, and um, just kind of it's a main struggle that goes on there. I don't know. Most people just think of Kazakhstan as like Borat and that shit, but uh, it's actually I don't know. It, it is kind of like a major space of how they operate. Um, right. No, it's a big, in, no, yeah, you know, it's, that's an important. So maybe something worth checking out. I hope I'm not the only like Central Asian news junkie out there. So no, I will definitely check it out. I'll, I'll okay. Thanks so much. Right. I'll talk to you soon. Then, all right. Thank okay. you. You get your left. <laughs> you're calling from, you're calling from a two, two, six area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, Michael, how's it going? It's Albert from Vancouver, Canada. Hey Albert, what's going on, man? Hey, I uh, I just wanted wanted to touch on the whole like Ben Shapiro libertarian thing, which is like yeah. the sort of peak faux intellectualism in the twenty first century, century. I think, yeah. and I think what liberals need to do is focus on their just fundamental misunderstanding of capitalist economics. Like, it's not even worth going into Marxist theory or any of that 
They don't even understand like, just basic capitalism. They don't know that market equilibrialization is a pre-assumption of economics. Markets just don't naturally do that. They don't know that uh, economics assumes perfect competition and perfect knowledge. They have no idea. And when you talk about this, they either just stop the conversation or change it to something else. But I think here's my thing, Albert. This, and I think it's all useful. I'm just interested, I, and I don't, you know, I don't know Ben Shapiro specifically, but I, I just think that there are a lot of people that are paid to be wrong. Like if you're if you're working at some think tank as an example that's funded by the Koch brothers. It doesn't matter if somebody corrects you on market equilibriums or how a market gets set in place. You're being paid to put forward intellectual products to advocate policies that help your donors. And that's why, you know, I'm much more interested mostly in where people get their funding than their ideas. Most people's ideas are pretty boring, but their funding tells you a lot. And I think that, you but know. But then why does. Yeah, so I think that that's. Sorry, just you know, but then why I, does I think media it's. Well, by the media is, the media is totally, I mean, yeah. compromised by all this stuff too. I mean, it's not like you know, it's not like media consolidation and corporate ownership of media doesn't have an effect on our democracy and even resources to do things like that. But I just think that you know, I'm not saying that there isn't. Of course, there's a room. You know, there's debate and there's you know, but but there's sort of three different tiers to it. And I, I one is you know. I think there are debates that are on premises and that are really fundamental. There is a conflict between how different people think society should work and why. And those are, in fact, value questions, and they are sort of basic political orientation questions. Then there's another range of debate, which is, you know, which is different. I mean, it's not a debate that I would have with somebody like Ben Shapiro because there are debates about, you know, we share some of the same goals and sense of the world but how do you bring about those things in actuality? But I think that there's plenty of people, especially the nature of the modern right, it's either kind of like dumb, you know, YouTube culture war shit, outright neo-Nazism, alt-right stuff, or it's just being a bag ban for, you know, a donor class. And in each of those situations, you're not dealing with people who are, it, it, you're, you're not the notion that you can sit and have an Oxford style debate with somebody who's either like covertly committed to fascism or someone whose whole paycheck relies or, you know, following relies on um, promoting not, not again, it's not bad economics because it's economics that works perfectly for what their policy agenda is. Right. Like we talk about Kansas for practical purposes for normal people. Of course, trickle down is a total failure and catastrophe. And you see it. It's in Kansas. It's obvious. But I don't know why the Koch brothers would view Kansas as a failure. I mean, they're still making money. Probably got some. I think they're located in Kansas. They probably, you know, they got some local tax yeah, breaks. They're in Wichita. So great. Why is that a failure for them? They don't care. But what about these masses that just go along? We got people in Canada yep. that are listening to the crazy people you got in the States and saying that we should take our own free freaking health care away. Like that actually they're, happens Well, they're, in they're morons. They're morons. But they're take well, there's, first so of all, because there's... So how do you there's change a, that? I, I think... You have to beat them. You have to beat them. You have to win. <laughs> you have to destroy them politically. <laughs> And it's, and that and and realize what you're dealing with. And my guess would be my sus, my suspicion in Canada too would be that the the point of that spear of attack is not, hey Canadians, let's take away your health care. I would assume it's you know, hey Canadians, Muslims are coming in and they're going to ruin all that shit. It's all the culture. Yeah, wars, well, it's, right? it's it's all libertarianism is just all is all racism. I'm I'm, I'm coming increasingly friggin' convinced of that. You know, like it's like they all point to Milo say, oh, this guy was going to a speech to hear a gay man speech who dates black men. And then you hear him, and who is Jewish uh, or, or Jewish descent, and then he's sending all this... Look, these, if, you're, if, your defense, if your defense, if your defense, if your, yes, anti-Semitic passwords. And let me, and let's, I, like, I can't believe I have to say this in the 21st century. <laughs> if your defense no, but... of not being racist is that you fuck black people, 
That is a profoundly racist statement. And it's not like this country doesn't have a history of, I don't know, everybody from fucking slave owners to a monster who didn't even die that long ago, like Strom Thurmond, raping, coercing, or maybe, you know, even having quote unquote consensual sex with people whose entire lives they were dedicated to destroying, robbing labor from, and snuffing out. To say that as a defense shows at best, at best, massive historical stupidity and illiteracy and probably just as much and more than likely racism. Thanks for the call, man. Stop, stop trying to shut down debate, Michael. Please stop, <laughs> stop trying to shut down exactly. debate. Exactly. But you see, that's kind of the point, right, is that we need to have more conversations like this. Like what's actually going on here? Versus trying to, you know, persu- like, hey, you know that, you know, Milo, actually, if you do an audit of every single college campus in the United States and you include, you know, the Big Ten schools and state schools in the Midwest and, you know, in Christian colleges, that actually you might find there's a lot more conservative professors that you realize. And actually, here's, you know, just as you have some anecdote about Brown, I have another anecdote about Brown about a kid saying something racist and we can just do anecdotes all day. You think Milo whose whole media platform and whole funding source from the Mercers was predicated on doing that. And then he's going to go, oh, thank you for this rational, charitable exchange of ideas. I'll revise what I think. <laughs> That's not the world we're in. It's ridiculous. And, and, the, and the people that keep trying to sell you on that are the unwitting handmaidens of the alt-right. And I'm actually going to be talking about this more on my show tomorrow. Thanks so much for the call, man. <laughs> No problem. Just as an anecdote, yeah. Canada, I had a conservative MP as a professor. Never a liberal MP, never an NDP MP, conservative MP as a professor. Thanks there a lot. Go. Have a good one. Thanks, brother. Bye-bye. All right. Last call of the day. I'm sorry I can't get to everyone. You're calling from a 604 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, Michael. This is Evan, uh, also from Vancouver, B.C., funny enough. Oh, wow. A lot of Canada today. Uh, What's going on, man? Yeah, a lot of can. Well, it's Thanksgiving up here, so happy Thanksgiving to all the Canadians. We don't have work, so nice. We're all at home calling you. Yeah, um, yeah. I wanted to call uh, and talk to you a little bit. The last time you were on, or the last time I saw you on, you were talking about uh, the NDP leadership race. Yeah, well, I was talking about Jagmeet um, Singh specifically. I was. I didn't get into the race. Yeah, yeah. You were talking about Jagmeet yeah. Singh specifically. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah. One one of the things you said was that he won on a uh, genuine sort of leftist platform and that that was that was what got him there um and you're gonna say to he, you're that. gonna say he did not i've been hearing this from a lot of ndp people <laughs> well yeah not that he not that he didn't i mean so his platform was certainly to the left of the last ndp federal race uh-huh um but that's always true in in the sort of democratic social party leadership race right 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 right, right. um but like, if you looked at the policy proposals from the four candidates in this leadership race, he probably was the rightmost candidate. So why do you think he won? Uh, I think he won because he brought in a lot of people, and that was the thing that I wanted to say. He did do mm-hmm. something really fantastic, yeah, which was he signed up more new members than the other three candidates combined. Well, there it is. I mean, that that it was see, like that it was is a spectacular the... ground game, and that's. You know, to me, like people ask about like these kind of trade offs and voting, and like obviously my instinct is always to vote for the leftmost candidate. But I got to tell you, if you've reached an acceptable bar of leftism, which my understanding of researching Jeff Jagmeet Singh is that he has, right? That's yeah, no, my no, understanding. I'm happy, I, I'm, if you reach that bar, I'm to the left of all four of them, but I'm happy with them. Right. And I'm sure I'm to the left of him too. But I would say that like if you've hit your bar, and you actually have a position that is real on, you know, say the environment or inequality or what, you know, and then, and then you also get a countervailing thing. Like I might be the guy to be the first NDP prime minister. Like that's pretty compelling because that's, you know, that's the paradox of our time is we need to be super unapologetically and move further and further and further to the left and be really serious. But then at the same time, like we have to win. You know, like I for 2016, yeah. people were so devastated about Bernie. For 2016, that race he ran was an incredible accomplishment. In 2020, we need to elect a progressive as president. Now, I'm not saying, of course, I'll do the caveat. If it sucks and it turns out badly, and it's Trump versus some fucking mediocre third wayer, I'm going to vote for the third wayer. That's voting, whatever. But we need to start electing 
Like Jeremy Corbyn needs to become prime minister of the UK. Someone like Bernie Sanders or Bernie Sanders himself needs to become president. And in Canada, you know, we need a real left or at the very least genuinely center left progressive leader like a Jagmeet Singh. So if he can actually sure. do that, you know, that to me is also, it's a balance, but that's compelling. And I mean, he does have some good policies. Like he, he is, you know, advocating putting in new, two new tax brackets. Um, he's advocating reinstating the estate tax up yep. here. Yep. Uh, you know, there's, there's good things on his list. Yeah. Um, I, w- I wanted to mention as well, like his win, it wasn't, it, this wasn't a small win. Like he won 53% of the vote on the first ballot. Wow. Uh, in, in, a, in a group of four. Like, is he bringing the in these, the other these races three? Usually go is, what's that? Is he going to work with the other three? Like, does he have, does he have sort of good... W- yeah, 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 no, no, no. So he, he, he's already said that he's going to make uh, my choice, you know, the, the head of something or other. I don't remember what it was, but... Okay. Um, and, and then one of the other ones he's, he's on as well. Like, I, I think probably all four of them will end up, you know, fairly high party officials. That's great. Because my my re, my understanding in the last election is that NDP moved pretty. I mean, I know Arthur from Winnipeg will not like this, but my understanding is that NB, NDP did move fairly, especially for a genuine social democratic party. They moved pretty far to the right on economic questions. Well, there, there was a, there was a difference between the party platform and the messaging. Mm. So the party platform, you you know, art. Art's right. Like, the party platform was pretty genuinely left. It Shut was the good, fuck it up! Was <laughs> Sorry. Um, but the, the, the mess, like, every time Tom Mulcair got a microphone put in his face, he was talking about balancing the budget or some shit like this, right? Very inspiring. Yeah. And it was like, yeah, I mean, nobody cares. Like, who gives a shit? Right, right, right. Right, like, and, and I mean, like, Canada doesn't have that big a debt. It's much smaller you know, per capita than the states. The deficit wasn't that bad. It was like, you know, I think the deficit was, it, the, the numbers were somewhere between one and two billion deficit. Right. Right, it was like some small, nobody cared. Right, right. And, and yet that was what he wanted to talk about. And it was like, I don't know, just talk about your tax ideas or talk about your housing ideas or like, yeah, talk, about real real talk about actual real things. Talk about actual real things, exactly. All right, man, I appreciate the call. Anyway. Thanks a million. Yeah, cheers. Take Happy Thanksgiving, care. everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. All right, a few more IMs, and then we're out of here. Uh, your, uh, Ryan Tennant, Trump. Hey, Puerto Rico, you're really messing up our budget by getting in the way of these hurricanes. Hey, Mike, fly to Indianapolis for two seconds. Tell everyone how much you hate black people. By the way, the uh, Jones Act waiver expired, and it doesn't look like they're going to uh, re-waive it. It's disgusting. Perez teaching at Brown wasn't one of the arguments being made to support his candidacy that he'd be able yep. to focus on. Yep, entirely on being the head of the DNC, and that would. Yep, it sure was. Uh, Woat. Um, uh, I don't understand that. I'm sorry. Spinster. Just wondered if you can continue the conversation you're having with Cliff on Friday with an academic about the unprecedented wealth of these political donors, their motivation, mindset, and lifestyle. We'll look for possible interviewees. Yes, I would be open to that for sure. Bender Dad, please put the call from Saul from Seoul on YouTube ASAP. Great, great show as always. Left is best. Um, CM... Uh, CM Michael Laylist to celebrate uh, Columbus Day. Philadelphia Inquirer had an editorial about how Lily, the, how Lily White trade unions are still in the city that is majority minority, seize the means, but only for white people. Is someone in the union this pissed the hell off of me? That's really weird. Um, did you see uh, Zaya Jelani's recent piece about Russia got a signal boost by Infowars? What's up with that? I have no idea. I don't know anything about any part of that. That is weird though. Christo. Anna Navarro, Amy Siskin, Bill Crystal, and, and George Will. Yes, I agree. Apparently, there's a Scalite version of uh, of uh, La Poupée. Jay Tingle, as I recall, the banana in the tailpipe got a lot of mileage in the Village Voice movie review. Um, <laughs> and the final I am of the day... <laughs> 
Denver Dave, the Atlantic reports that Trump's that Pence's drama queen stunt cost a hundred thousand dollars for just the flight to Indianapolis. More if the other transportation and security costs are included. We are back live tomorrow, everybody. Thank you. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm gonna get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. But finding out won't make me feel any better. Yeah, I know. Shifted in and out